All right. Hello, everybody. Paul Grand here, CEO, MedTech Innovator. Welcome to another in our series of MedTech Innovator Live. This is an opportunity for companies in the MedTech Innovator cohort to get their questions answered from a panel of experts. We do this every single week, same time, same day. So if this is your first time tuning in, uh, you'll see us here every week at 1030 Pacific, every Thursday. So please be, uh, feel free to come back and join us in the future. Um, and also look at medtechinnovator.org slash live for our archive broadcast from the past sessions. Um, these are really incredible opportunities to hear from some of the leading experts in the field about what's happening day to day on the ground in the med tech industry, to have questions answered that all of us have. The companies that are in our med tech innovator accelerator cohort have provided questions in advance that they're interested in. And we've used that to craft the conversation for today. So these are literally the things that are on the minds of people who are actively producing medical devices, digital health technologies and diagnostics as we speak. Uh, today's webinar is on human-centered design in a digital world, which is a really great topic. It's something that I'm really interested in. It's something that I know a lot of our companies are right in the middle of, of being involved with right now. And that is, you know, their design and in linking together not only the physical, but also the digital part of what they're doing. Uh, so we're going to talk a lot about that today uh, with a group of experts from Zymedica, Zymedica is a firm that's one of our partners at MedTech Innovator and has been for years. We're extremely choosy about who we partner with, uh, whether it's a manufacturer or a service provider or others. Uh, we are very particular about who we let into the MedTech Innovator ecosystem, as anyone in this ecosystem knows. Uh, and that speaks volumes about Zymedica because they're one of our top partners and someone we're really excited uh, to have on our team. So. What I want to do now is introduce our panel for today. Uh, there's going to be three panelists um, from Zymedica. So I'll start off with David Copeland, who's Director of Human Centered Design for Zymedica. So David, why don't you tell us about yourself and Zymedica a little bit and your role there and how you became involved in uh, human centered design. Sure. Thank you, Paul. Uh, hello to everybody out there. Nice to be on the panel today. Uh, yeah, so uh, David Copeland, uh, as, as Paul had said, I'm a director of human centered industrial design, background is ID, went to Carnegie Mellon all those years ago. Been doing product development for about 25 years, um, always you know, in a very consumer uh, mindset. So really thinking about the users and, and consumer products and safety and all kinds of different spaces. Been doing healthcare exclusively the, really the past 10 or 15 years with Zymedica and our company fundamentally made the choice years ago Zymedica, we're based in Providence, now we have offices in Minnesota, we have presence in San Fran, as well as uh, Philadelphia and Hong Kong, so we definitely have worldwide presence and, and definitely across the states. Um, we were doing uh, all kinds of different product development, always with an eye on delivering something to market, so we're not just a design firm, we're really a delivery company, so taking something from napkin sketch to market has always been part of our DNA. We pivoted about 10 or 15 years ago, looking at healthcare being a very uh, ripe opportunity for having a lot of innovation opportunity uh, that we could, you know, help our clients through that that whole navigation. So we, we definitely pivot as a company. And so really, we've been doing healthcare exclusively the past 10 to 15 years. And my, I myself am in our Minnesota office. Um, and I lead a team of folks that are in the ID space, as well as research and strategy and work with human factors too, to really do a lot of early front end, um, understanding needs and opportunities, uh, understanding user or, or limit, uh, maybe limitations and, and specific functional needs and really developing concepts that take our, our clients' business goals, technologies into consideration, marrying them with users to really deliver uh, products that are going to be hopefully world changing and really enabling for all the users, not just the doctors, the nurses, but also the patients, uh, the caregivers at home, all those different uh, users in the spectrum to really benefit from things that we're working on. So that's a little bit about me and a little, uh, just a little bit about Zymedica. Perfect. Thank you very much, David. All right, next, Mike Neider. Uh, Mike is the Vice President of Strategic Development on the West Coast for Zymedica. So uh, Mike, tell us about yourself. Yeah, thanks, Paul, and uh, delighted to be here. This is my my second year uh, being an advisor to MedTech Innovator, and it's a it's a great partnership. Uh, I always love uh, talking to the the cohort companies. Uh, there's always uh, 
it, it's always fascinating to see the the innovation uh, that's uh, that's out there and, and the companies that come through the program. Uh, as Paul mentioned, I'm the vice president of strategic development uh, for the West Coast for Zymedica, and that basically means uh, while uh, David and, and Jan are, are doing all the work. <laughs> uh, my role is sort of the strategic integrator, right? So I'm bringing the voice of business uh, and reflecting that back to our development teams, right? So, uh, you know, when you look at things like uh, design and development, you know, how, uh, how do your business needs get reflected back into those efforts, right? And how do you think holistically uh, about what you need to do as, uh, as a startup uh, to get to market or to get to exit, right? Whatever your, uh, you know, whatever your, your, your final goals are. Uh, I, I got to uh, Zymedica and I got to this, uh, uh, this sort of role uh, by a sort of a roundabout way. I've been in medical devices for about 20 years, uh, about 17 or so of that was with Medtronic, uh, first as an engineer, uh, and then in a, a strategic role, uh, a portfolio management type role, and I've commercialized uh, or had a hand in commercializing any number of devices, uh, pacing leads, pacing delivery systems, uh, cardiac navigation, uh, balloon angioplasty, drug eluting stents, renal denervation. Uh, so, you know, kind of a, a broad range from capital equipment uh, through to, to class three implantables. Uh, and I take that same sort of uh, approach, um, you know, or those kinds of learnings into uh, the, the companies that we work with now. Terrific, great background, and uh, lucky to have you uh, here as an advisor uh, again this year. So thank you, Mike. Uh, I know our companies are really appreciative of that. Uh, all right, and then uh, Jan. Um, so uh, Jan is Director of Digital Products uh, for Zymedica. Jan, you wanna introduce yourself? Yeah, sure, I, thanks for having us. Um, my name is Jan Zukowski, Director of Digital Products for Zymedica. Um, really what that role is, is uh, helping our clients and our partners become more of a digitally connected uh, device and become part of that world as, as we move forward. Uh, especially more relevant now, uh, being in an environment with, with COVID-19 and we're seeing a lot of the industry start pivoting to healthcare uh, that is more uh, connected and remote. And how can we connect patients with their their doctors and still provide that same level of care that they would expect being face-to-face -face in, in a remote setting. So my background, I've been in software engineering for the past 22 years, uh, 13 or 14 of those being in uh, health technology itself. Uh, so in, in that time, I, I've seen a lot of how the industry has changed, especially uh, when I first started off with a, a company called Compact that was way back when merged with Hewlett Packard and we had a CEO at the time, this was probably 1999, 2000, and was really saying everything is gonna go to the web, everything's gonna go to the internet. And just how true that is today that we live off of being in a connected world and everything is at our, our fingertips, whether it's where we're buying things as a consumer or connecting with people socially or even talking to our doctors doing telehealth, telemedicine. So. My role really is uh, guiding those conversations through the early phase work and putting together strategies and solutions that make sense for our clients and their, their patients as we're moving forward, regardless of, of what that device or that experience needs to be. Terrific, thanks. Um, all right, so you can see everyone, expert panel here um, with a ton of experience, both you know previously before Zymedica in many cases at some of the major med tech companies um, and, uh, and now working with those companies, large and small, um, at Zymedica. So really uh, lucky to have you guys on this. So uh, let's get right into it and talk about human-centered design, first of all. You know, what is it? Uh, give us a brief description, kind of just so everyone, you know, have a level set for what we're talking about here. Um, David, why don't you take that? Yeah, thank you, Paul. Uh, so uh, the the HCD process, human centered design process, is is really not new, but I would say uh, new in the past ten to fifteen years. Really, a good focus is is um, has has taken hold of, of the industry, and we're seeing it in all different aspects of industry. Healthcare is is, is no exception. So, depending on who you talk to, there's kind of four principles that really build up or, or make up um, human centered design. 
The first one is to really understand and address the core problems to solve the issues, not the symptoms. So really understanding, getting out of the field, uh, understanding the context, asking why, going deep into that versus just sort of assuming you understand the challenge or problem, but really being smart about that. But really, you know, that core problem is, is really what we're trying to get after and, and solve for. Second pillar is really being, being people-centered, um, needs and abilities, making sure you understand your users and their limitations and their expectations too is, re is very important. So it's not deciding what the right choice is, but having them help you decide what the right choice is and really being sure that they're the center of the conversation for sure. And then third pillar being everything's a system. Look at the whole activity. Uh, don't just look at the one moment where they squeeze a trigger and actuate something or click a, a, an icon on a screen, but understand the unpackaging event, the setup, the takedown, the cleanup, um, the, the post care, all that is part of the system that your product has an impact or it has an impact on. So really looking at the whole system and how you can really influence it and create a whole experience is very, very important. And then, and finally, the fourth pillar is really rapid iteration and testing. I mean, if people talk about Jira, we talk about you know agile development. You know, that's it's one element in software, but really in, in in the the physical side of things too, we're rapidly creating physical models or concepts we can go out and test and get feedback on with users. So that that fail fast and fail early is very very important uh, pillar of that the HCD sort of process. So following up on that then, David, you know, you mentioned user a bunch of times, um, you know, user-centered design, user at the center. Uh, in many ways, I think, too, that we talk a lot about, obviously, patient at the center of kind of the value equation, you know, here the user is the center, but the user is not necessarily the patient. Um, so, you know, who is the user in, you know, when we think of, you know, the healthcare-specific uh, HCD? Um, and, and also re related to that, you know, how is that kind of user experience that we're all getting used to, you know, with our phones without buttons or, you know, or just a wonderful, a wonderful, uh, you know, beautiful world that just kind of works. And as you said, even the packaging and unboxing experience, how is that influencing uh, medical design? Great two-part question. I think the first one, and I'll make sure that Mike and Jan are able to chime in as well too. Um, the, by user, we're being, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a broad statement. The user could be the physician. It could be the nurse tech. It could be the circulating. It could be someone who's in sterilization. It could be the patient. It could be the caregiver. It could be someone that is that is part of the packaging uh, or, or fabrication of the system too, to, to create and put it together. Um, and it could be the caregiver at home, right? It could be an aunt or uncle who may have to help out with something. So we look at users being anybody who's coming into contact with a component of your system or design is a user and has a has both an opinion and, is, is as, and also a stakeholder too. And that could be someone also at the hospital who chooses to purchase this product or who maintains it too. So really it's not just the use of the device, it's also, or the technology, it's anybody who's impacting its experience and, and touching it we see as being the user. So that's a very important uh, wide range of people that we have to think about and, and consult with. And they all have different impacts on the system and maybe different um, perspectives, of course, and also a different value, but we make sure they're all equally important to be understood and heard in, in understanding how a product could be used for sure. I don't know if Michael. Yeah, 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 no, it, it, it's, 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 it's second point. Yeah. Yeah, it's a it's a great point, right? And you know, and I think it's it's worth a company from a business perspective perspective, taking a look at who's influencing the purchasing decision, right? Uh, so I think there's the usability factor that, that Dave talked about and everyone that's touching uh, a device and using it, uh, but also people who are influencing the decisions uh, play a role in, term, in terms of uh, making a, a buying decision and an adoption decision, right? So, you know, if it's a, a nurse that has to move around a, a big bulky cart, right? And it's just a, a pain in the neck to move this cart around. Uh, or a lot of times if you're in uh, a cath lab or something like that, it's oftentimes the nurse uh, who will go into the storage cabinet and pick out uh, a device, right? So if it's easy to pick off the shelf, if it sticks out, uh, if, it's, if it's easy to see, uh, chances are they might actually pick a device based on, on packaging. Uh, and similarly, especially when you get into the capital device world, you know, if you think about administrators and uh, uh, people running uh, operating rooms, uh, you know, where are you going to put the device? Where are you going to store it? Uh, you know, those are all sort of basic usability questions, uh, but they do play a role in, uh, in certainly in adoption more than anything else. And yeah, and just to touch 
yeah, just yeah. Uh, on a couple of their topics that they've already talked about. Uh, Dave mentioned uh, a couple of good points before that if you think of it as an, a complete system. So uh, outside of the users, it's also how each of these individual components, these systems interact with each other. Uh, Dave, Dave mentioned an agile process. So you're writing your stories and you're saying as a, I want so that I can, and that as a can be a, a person, it could be a connected system. So it could be uh, as a Bluetooth enabled phone, I want to connect to a pulse ox so that I can measure uh, pulse and oxygen level. And from a cloud perspective, uh, how those connect through APIs and from a data analytics and visualization perspective. So from a big picture, it's how all of these different touch points are working together to see that a holistic ecosystem and how everything is moving together uh, from conceptualization. It could be that person taking the device out of the box. And as we all know, uh, we, we just want things to work and you take it out, you turn it on and, and it should just connect. So making that as easy as possible and understanding our users and uh, maybe the, the cohorts that they fall into, especially with healthcare, where we're concerned with age brackets and, and genders and uh, uh, risk factors that people have and comorbidities and how they fall into this so that Maybe we can do some predictive analytics, but just understanding who your users are and how these systems are connecting uh, is, is really important in that whole process. And, and following up on that, Jan, um, mm. know, typically a little more on, on, uh, on the digital side um, and focusing on that, you know, what are some of the big change? What are, you know, how is digital driving change in healthcare? Um, and specifically, you know, talking about devices um, perhaps, or maybe digital health solutions, diagnostics. You know, um, we talked before this in advance and, you know, you mentioned the other, or I think your, your whole team talked about the idea that digital is kind of like leading the leading the, the conversation now and it's the data and the digital part and the device is kind of this physical thing to make, maybe make enable that versus making a device and then going, oh yeah, and I guess it can capture some data and maybe we can do something with that data, which is the way I think things, you know, have been in the past. So maybe just give us kind of a quick snapshot on just, you know, some of the ways in which digital is really driving change now, you know, when people are coming to you and saying, we want to design this new thing, you know, how is digital driving the conversation? Definitely, definitely. And uh, some of the points that were already brought up uh, from those early conversations, we want to understand how it's going to be used and buy it and operating with it. So taking that human centered approach, uh, just getting the, the, the full picture of how it's going to play a role in everyone's daily lives or uh, where they work or what they're going to be doing. So uh, by working with that way, uh, partnering with uh, great folks over in our uh, human-centered industrial design department and human factors, we can work together and really develop that picture of how this is going to play. And then after that, we start working on those touch points. And it's starting off and understanding what their needs are, which is really going to affect how we're building out the system in all. Um, I, I sometimes joke and it's like the, the, the people that I, I really like to talk to the most are, are the marketing folks of, of a company because you kind of get their impression of how this is going to play in everybody's lives. And then you start talking to the patients and doctors to see, all right, this is the, the initial picture. How, is, how would you use this and what is your impression of it? So that as we start going on, we're, we're getting the idea of everybody and we, we can really see how it's going to be used. And uh, so we start with that approach and then we start developing that way and developing the, the technology and the needs around what they're going to be doing, how these are going to be connecting in, uh, what are all the touch points and, and the, the data items that we need to collect and after that, what do they want to see? What do they want to get out of this? How is this going to be influencing a, a process or making someone's life better so that we can really get that experience going? That's great, Jan, that's really helpful. So when I, you know, as I'm thinking now about kind of this, you know, the idea of, you know, a, a device, you know, some devices obviously lend themselves like kind of conceptually to being, you know, a wearable, for example, you know, that makes a lot of mm -hmm. sense, it's going to have data and that's going to, you know, and I understand how that's going to be valuable. What about something like, you know, an ablation device or something um, or a, 
you know, a drill or something, you know, some, some other device that, you know, maybe inherently we don't think of as digital, you know, um, how does, how does digital increase the value for that, that particular product and data? Oh, definitely. So uh, whether it's a, a drill or uh, maybe some orthopedics, you're, you're developing a robot to assist surgery for knee surgery, for example. So um, the things that you're looking into that maybe you don't think of as a patient, uh, but the doctors think of is angle of cuts and um, taking a look at the system. Uh, how is this going to even be put on a table? Is How is it going to be sturdy? So you're thinking about some of the, the safety issues that, that go into some of these surgical robots uh, along with it as, as you're developing out this, this system. And uh, especially with the cuts, are you developing software to help the, the doctor? Are there things in pre-op that they're taking into consideration, some other devices, x-ray machines that you're collecting data in? So uh, building out that ecosystem and kind of understanding how it's going to fit in. Um, I know uh, we we're just working on a uh, scope device as well and uh, really developing out how the software is going to work and how the cameras on this can be rotated. And even from what does the doctor want to see? Is this something that can put a mask on it because the camera is round or do they want a wider view of this? Uh, how, how are the, the lasers going to be positioned and turned on? And what are some of the safety aspects? If something is not working here, should you be able to go on with a surgery if something isn't functioning correctly. So even with the opening diagnostics and running through everything of the machine uh, is, is really important in putting into that experience as it goes on. And what do you do when something's not working right? How does this pivot? And how, how do you get help to, to fix it and move forward? Great. And if I can add one thing to that, uh, Paul, I, mean, I think it's an important point, right? That, you know, adding a digital interface to something, it it has to be in service of something valuable, right? You know, don't put it on there just because, you know, you think mm -hmm. it's going to look flash or it's going to be fancy or, or whatnot, right? It has to be providing some information, you know, if it is giving the physician, uh, you know, angular information or depth information or, or something like that, that they don't have or that they've been eyeballing off of fluoroscopy or, or whatnot, you know, that's valuable information, uh, you know, but just, slapping a, a digital interface on something that doesn't need it, you know, is, is, is sort of pointless. I mean, then maybe that's an obvious point, uh, but uh, you know, there's, there still is a place for old school mechanical type devices, you know, but you know, if, you, if you're going to add a digital interface to something that, uh, you know, historically hasn't had one, you know, you have to think through like what value is this providing to, uh, to the physician or to the, to the end user. I think yeah. what Mike is talking about too is the whole collaboration. Like these are not happening in different silos, right? Anytime you have a device and you add a screen to it, we have to think about how they work together and how. In, and I think what Michael's talking about and Jan as well too is is understanding the value that they're they're going to provide before we put a button on something or before we, before we put an icon on a screen. We have to understand what the value is going to be for the for these users and not just doing something because you can do it, but really what is the value of it? So. You know, look at, at what it can mean I mean, for the users. You can definitely track things like, you know, angle of, of insertion or tra tool tracking, things like that. Also, for the hospitals, too, do you start understanding efficiency? Do you start understanding uh, length of procedures? Do you start understanding um, how, you know, all kinds of, of, of information that could be great to optimize and improve the duration of the surgeries? Um, that I think is, is, is beyond just the immediate procedure, but it goes to a global impact that can have for the hospital and their efficiency and their quality of care um, if they can have some, some smart systems that really help to understand some of our habits and, and practices, then how we can improve them for sure. So I think it's a very broad net that the digital component can be, not just a screen, but also the information it can provide to the caregivers and, and to ultimately to decision makers. And, and hopefully it'll impact all of us and improve all of our experiences and all of our you know, care uh, opportunities for sure. Yeah, no, I love that you brought that up, Dave, because that, that is a trend and uh, coming into surgical theater, uh, doctors are always looking and of course the board of directors are looking too, how can they improve efficiency and safety of their surgeries? So building in these tools, and that's a great uh, example of value, taking information from the surgical theater so that they can go back and analyze it and even add it to their post-op notes. So if they have software that they can start off with pre-op, put together what their, uh, their SOP for the surgery is going to be, and each inflection point, have that data come back so it's readily available afterwards. 
Um, it, that, that stuff is invaluable to them right now. Yeah, agreed. And I was going to say, in addition to all that, you know, then there's the payer, um, ultimately, or the, you know, the purchaser and whoever that is, whether it's a consumer, the hospital, uh, employer, insurer, uh, and so on, whoever that, that purchasing decision, um, you know, is being made by, ultimately, is going to look at data, and is going to want to look back and see, you know, if this is cost efficient, improving outcomes, all those things, and and be able to make decisions in the data that these devices generate is really, I think, ultimately, or, or technologies generate is uh, is really what's going to drive that um, or be a big driver in that. So good stuff. Good opening, guys. Um, thanks for kind of giving all that context. Um, I, there was a couple of questions that have been submitted um, through our YouTube live stream um, chat. So I'm going to get to those in a minute. I want to just remind everybody. So if you're watching this on our YouTube live stream, you can you can use the chat box. I will be monitoring that um, for our companies. They're just going to submit questions to the Q&A function and through the chat in Zoom. Um, but for anyone who's watching on YouTube, you can use the uh, the live chat for that. So I'm just going to ask uh, one of the two of the questions that came into the YouTube very quickly, just so I can get to those, since those people won't be on our Q&A at the end. Um, one question generally for, um, for Zymedica was, when clients come in and start working with you, do they generally have an idea of what design they need, or do they need a lot of help, you know, assistance, assistance in that? I'll jump in. It takes all shapes and sizes, and and our model is is tailored that we can take something from beginning all the way to to market. So, um, our our clients come at all shapes and sizes, and fundamentally, I, I kind of bucketize in some ways. They either usually come with the technology, saying we got something we were excited about. We, it can be used for this. We think it's going to have great impact. We just don't know how to commercialize it. How does it want to be packaged and, and make it something that people want to use and break into the market with? So that's a, that's a great perspective. Other times they have a great idea. Hey, I see a, dis, a disrupting opportunity here, some way to really improve the quality of care, but I don't quite know how it's going to work. We need you guys to help, help develop that. And there's a lot of different flavors that kind of, kind of happen. So um, sometimes clients come in early, we, we go through a, a six phase process, phase zero, which is really about framing up the opportunity, the needs, understanding what's not known, de-risking de things a little bit. And then phases one, two, three, four, and five get into gradual, um, more um, de depth phases of design and delivery and, you know, and, and, and ultimately manufacturing into market. And our clients can come in at any one point in time. So they may have a technology or product that is kind of ready to go, but they have something that's a showstopper. They have something that's not quite working well, or they got dinged with the FDA submission for usability and they need help with, with understanding the impact of that and how to resolve some of those challenges. Or they may come in early on saying, boy, we really need you guys to think out of the box a little bit. We're in our, in our cubicle, we're in our hallway. We can't think broad. Can you guys help us out? And so we may bring you know folks like Jan and Mike and team in human factors, engineering, you know, regulatory, whatever, into the conversation to help build out the ideas and give them a strategy or give them a platform or give them a technology um, or help develop it. So uh, I think they come, uh, clients come to us in a very mature and very immature, I don't mean in a bad way, but a very new to market, something is emerging, I'm excited about it, don't quite know what it is yet, and I need help kind of figuring it out mode, and, and we can really help them through all those different kind of scenarios. Great. And, and David, one more question for you, and then we're going to move on, which is um, specific to self-administered um, technologies. So like, like uh, an auto injector or, um, or home infusion, um, you know, in that case, you know, that's obviously a very different kind of experience than when it's a trained physician or caregiver who's um, doing something. So, is, uh, you know, can you tell us a little bit about, you know, specifically um, some of your experiences in that area? That's a great question. Uh, we know that um, care is coming home with people, right? You're being sent home with either something to, to, to take care of or to use, or you're going to your local target or your pharmacy and picking up something to then self-administer. And the reality is that, that, that that expectation of care is now going home, right? And you're now becoming the expert. So we have to design in a very intelligent way that we make sure that we're not designing for a trained physician. We're doing something that can be used by anybody. And we've got a number of, I mean, really from our, our DNA as a company, we've done a ton of programs that are in the, um, we didn't work for, for MyZeo, which is a sleep study or a sleep device that basically monitors and tracks sleep. We're doing also uh, Gecko Cap, I believe, I forgot the name of the company specifically, but they do uh, dose tracking for inhalers. How do you make sure little Jimmy 
is using an inhaler, you can ask him, he says, yeah, mom, I'm using it. Or do you put a little topper on top of the inhaler? Every time he uses it, it talks to your, your mobile phone. You can track the usage. Uh, so we're doing a lot of self-care things that are basically, you know, some are monitoring, some are active, you know, delivery. You mentioned auto injectors. We've done a lot of work with companies like BD, like Lilly, working through those systems and understanding uh, drug labeling and information and then delivery of devices and tracking, uh, monitoring the amount of dosage that is either drawn or, or dispensed. So you can kind of have an active tracking and dosing uh, mechanism to track your, your progress. So we've got a lot of experience with self-regulated healthcare and it's uh, it has different challenges to make sure that we're designing well enough uh, the, 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 the device that can be used um, every time effectively by someone who is not a trained user. Thanks. All right. So let's, uh, let's move ahead a little bit um, in terms of, you know, when the when, so you mentioned, you know, clients coming in with all sorts of different, you know, levels of, of, uh, of experience and expectations and, and, and product uh, uh, development, whether it's an idea, they've got something they've already been working on, but what's the when, um, when's the appropriate time to start thinking about human centered design? Um, is it after you've figured out, you know, the unmet medical need and all the and the way in which you want to solve it. And then once you've kind of figured all that out and done the engineering, then you bring in the HCD team um, or is HCD something you start with in the very beginning? So David, you can take that as well. Yeah, certainly. I mean, uh, you know, it's going to sound so serving, but I believe HCD should be involved early uh, in the process. Uh, traditionally, I mean, sometimes clients may have come to us in the past with, you know, a very robust um, solution. And they say, okay, now it's ready to kind of get designed for the user. And the reality is we oftentimes have to kind of backtrack a little bit because maybe there's a, a function or a mechanism or a component of it that they have convinced themselves is the right way to do it. And they've engineered to that point. Um, and then they realize that maybe that's not how someone's gonna use it. You get out in the field, you look at what the FDA has said years ago, it used to be user error. When, when something happened medically that was a, uh, had a negative effect, it was called user error. Uh, and that basically put the onus on us as users saying, we messed up. That's not the case. It's actually been termed as being use error, which puts the burden back on the developer to make sure you're using a product, you're developing a product that can be used effectively, safely um, every time. So I think that the challenge is the more mature the development of something gets, the more opportunities to have to make a U-turn, have to rethink something uh, pop up. The earlier you get HCD involved and, you know, digital uh, physical, whatever component you were working on, you have a chance to fail fast. Fail when it's also least expensive when you're on paper versus when you are in prototype and parts and delivery uh, systems and, and engineering uh, wise. So um, it's it's an opportunity to really get those, those um, exercise the demons early, make sure you're not making missteps before you invest a lot of dollars into something that you could have to rethink at some point. Yeah, good advice. Uh, all right, Jan. So we talked- yeah, it I, I was going to jump on that, that same question and just kind of uh, piggyback on some of the things that Dave said, and I completely agree with them. Those, those are really early phase things that, that need to happen. Um, from a, a digital standpoint or even from a physical standpoint, uh, we always have it in our head. How is this thing that, that we're making going to be used? Um, as, as an example, uh, currently on a project, it, it's for a novel device, and by novel, I mean it, it's really a, a first of its kind that uh, uh, a company came to us with an idea and said, this, this is what we want to do. And, and we thought it sounded really great, and a lot of us could identify it, identify with it, uh, how it fits into a, a pediatric unit, and uh, ha having kids who are, who are in the NICU and five and a half weeks early knew exactly the processes that they, that we were, they were talking about and how this could work. So we felt invested right away and immediately we're thinking, how is this going to work? Who's going to be using this? So e even we weren't even there yet. And we just want to take a look at the technologies that we can use and start ideating around, but we still have that in our head. Well, if I was to use this, this is how I would be. And these, these are my expectations. So it, it, I think by human nature, we, we add that into our process early on as we're going. And uh, to Dave's point, if you wait too long, and especially with our phase system, uh, we, we've put together operating procedures so that 
it can guide us along this, this path, especially as we're building med devices. And we have risk analysis and validation and a lot of things that need to do before you can do uh, uh, send to the FDA for, for approval. Uh, so we're thinking early on to get all of this ready so that it can be validated and usability tested and accessibility tested so that when we go into development, we have all of our ducks in a row. And sometimes waiting too long, especially to maybe like that phase two where you're starting to build it and you haven't had those conversations yet. Uh, we, we have a great mechanical device, but we haven't engaged digital yet on how it's going to use. And uh, if you're working with a smaller company and uh, you've really budgeted out, maybe a few months can go on and you try as hard as you can to keep that management team in, in place so that when the next work comes in, but Sometimes the nature of the beast, people get put on other projects and there might be a gap and you're not having those discussions. Um, from a digital side, we not, might not know what industrial design did on their end previously and there's nobody there to, to speak to it. So they're off, they're off and they built a great thing and we're off and we built a great thing. And you look at them and you're like, they, they look like two different products. How are they gonna fit together? So taking us out of silos, as Dave mentioned earlier, and just having those conversations early on and, and all being on the same page really helps out. It, it saves money down the road. You've done all your planning up front and uh, you, you know who the users are gonna be. Great points. So, you know, as we're thinking about um, the world we're living in today, this post COVID world, or maybe we're in the COVID world and there'll be a post COVID world. Um, so wherever we are, you know, in this in this universe now, you know, things have changed a lot in, in terms of, you know, the healthcare system and healthcare delivery. And, uh, you know, what are some of the ways in which COVID-19 is affecting this, you know, the, the field, the discipline of human-centered design? Um, you know, when people think about things like, you know, workshops and focus groups, um, how is that changing? Are there improvements um, that have happened as a result of COVID-19 that are, you know, are actually making things better? So uh, why don't we start with, uh, I don't know, David on that? <laughs> sure, I think we'll all chime in. We all have opinions for sure. <laughs> I think it's making us sharpen our spear, to be honest with you. We've got a lot of tools in our toolbox we've used over the years. And what's kind of funny, is I, I start with the foundation of, of conversation that we've had as, as a company. We've, we've had multiple offices for, for 15 to 20 years. And we've had to do collaboration remotely for a long time. And that was because of distance, right? So we definitely traveled to and from offices and client sites to meet with them host workshops, have clients coming in. That's part of what we do. But now travel is definitely more challenging. So we have always used tools um, like Miro or like Teams and things like that that allow us to, to collaborate uh, for sure. So I think we've gotten, we've, we've gotten better about using those um, as a team and as a group to really collaborate and truly um, you know, collaborate used to be uh, around the water cooler or finding a table in an office and chatting about as a team, but we can't always do that. So I think it's made us sharpen our game a little bit and, and really optimize those engagements where we can have people together in Teams, in Miro, in some, some formats, in Zoom or go to wherever it wants to be and, and, and do it very well. Um, so that's been a, I think it's, it's been a change for us and, and we are, people are still going to offices. We are a, an essential service, so we can definitely use that to our benefit, which is great. Um, but we are working remotely quite a bit. And I think, too, that also impacts how we do a lot of our usability um, studies and work on the front end, too, is that we've had to get more clever with how we do studies. Uh, we've all currently have gone to banks and restaurants and places. You've seen the, the plexiglass shields that are all now between you and your, your provider or your, your, um, some of your meeting at a, at a company. Um, we use those. We did a study here last week for a client and, or two weeks ago, and it, it went very, very well. But it was all about properly setting up and preparing for that. And I think that same thing goes with studies too. We're still doing studies, but it, it sharpens how we're doing them. We're having to maybe send out kits ahead of time versus being there in person. Do we send out kits and then do we live stream the activity either proctoring on site or remotely? Um, fewer people are involved to be safe about you know, transmission of anything, but uh, it really changes how we're going about um, uh, you know, doing some of these practices. But I think it's honestly giving us a better tool set and sharpening our skills. And I think not as inefficient as, as people had thought it could be. I think it's actually quite efficient way of going off business. And I'll relay a funny story really quick. One of our clients was looking at actually uh, taking our usability experts, renting a bus and driving them around the country in during, you know, for all of these studies versus putting them in airplanes and flying them. Because their, their belief was if we can quarantine them together, we can do the study in multiple sites 
uh, but keep that group together for a period of time. And so not outrageous, but definitely a different way of going about it. Interesting. Um, I, I like that. So, um, you know, in general, you know, we're, we're seeing that there's, um, you know, been, I mean, as I talk to companies, I'm hearing all the time about, you know, some of these new tools they're using. You mentioned um, before Teams, which I think, you know, a lot of people are using Zoom or Teams or others. What was the first one you said? Was it Miro? Yeah, Miro. Um, I forgot the URL. I, I have an app on my, my dashboard or I, I can check out later on. But what it is allows us to do, and this is, I'll bring back to a client. We just worked with um, Lexagene. Uh, They're in, in Beverly, Massachusetts, and they had, it's interesting. They You mentioned how COVID has changed things. Uh, we're finding clients that are basically in, we do, I do a lot of work in the diagnostic space too. So think about lab-based equipment for diagnosing conditions, sepsis, uh, could be whatever. But a lot of our clients are now pivoting to COVID. Great opportunity to kind of bring technology and help immediate need. So this client, Lexagene, had a, um, a, a veterinary diagnostic system and they wanted to pivot. They said, hey, we can help support the need for better COVID testing. So we helped them. And in a matter of six or seven months, we went from, from um, they, had a, they had proven t- um, assay and reagent and you know, a formula, basically a system that worked. We, t- we took it, we helped commercialize that assay and that, that, that lab benchtop science and, and delivered a device to them within six months that was meant to be guided and used for COVID among other uh, opportunities. And so the challenge is the first meeting we had with them was face-to-face late January. They were so excited about collaborating, so excited to work face-to-face and be able to be you know, down in our office and everything. And the next week COVID hit and we said, we, we can't travel, you can't travel. We can't be face-to-face. We brought in a tool like Miro, which is basically an online collaboration uh, whiteboard, white space where you could put up imagery, text, video, whatever. And we all four could be on it. You could have 20 people on it. We could all be moving things around and you'd see where people are in, in space and time. And you can collaborate, you can add content, you can make notes, you can draw things, you can sort of make the connections that are necessary, but allows us to have that working face-to-face session that we love so much, so dearly in early phase innovation. We can still do that uh, remotely and online and have the kind of level of collaboration. And after that first meeting, we shared with them uh, meeting a set expectation. We had a review meeting with them with concepts were in play. At the end of the meeting, they said, this is exactly the kind of experience we expected from working with you. So using a tool like that to have that kind of impact was very important for us, but allows us to kind of have that, that quality of care that we've always given our clients has been really largely uninterrupted. Great. Thank you for, uh, thank you for going into the detail on that. Um, yeah, my, I, I was, I was oh, just going to add on to yeah. that real quick. You know, I, I had a different take on that question. You know, I think Dave's was the how, like how do we uh, handle human-centered design and sort of the COVID era. Uh, but I think there's also a, a what that's changing. And I, I, I essentially view COVID as an accelerator to this mega trend that was already happening in moving healthcare out of the hospital and more into the home uh, or ambulatory care units, right? And, and that desire to either keep patients out of the hospital or, uh, you know, move them from treatment to home care very quickly, right? And that was initially essentially driven by trying to reduce costs out of the healthcare system. But it, it seems like COVID is, is accelerating that, right? Where uh, there's a motivator for people definitely not to want to go to hospitals. Uh, but then people are also getting comfortable doing things from, from home, right? And it, it shifts the, the human-centered design uh, discussion a little bit uh, because it, it elevates the patients uh, as the user maybe much more than they ever were in the past, right? So instead of designing you know, for the physician with the patient as an afterthought, uh, a lot more now uh, you're elevating the, the patient, you know, and then you get into what Jan uh, was talking about in terms of connectivity and, you know, how do you uh, build that interface either up to uh, the cloud to transmit uh, the data or, you know, communicate to a caregiver or, or what have you, right? So, you know, I, I, you know, I think from a, a mega trend standpoint, you know, and I think you see a lot of the med tech innovator companies are sort of playing in this space, right, where, uh, you know, they're, they're moving the point of care from the hospital to, to somewhere else, you know, oftentimes the, the home. Yep. Yeah, no, I agree. So I'm going to stick with you, Mike, to, uh, to move on and, and, and this discussion. And, and I want to talk a little bit about, about the value of human centered design, um, not only, you know, for the, the product, but, you know, our investors seeing value in human centered design processes, um, or is this just something that, you know, companies just have to do operationally? 
Um, do you have any experience in that? I know you're uh, you're helping a lot of startups. Yeah, you know, and I, I think the the example that I always give, you know, and if, if you're familiar with the history of interventional cardiology, uh, the the advent of the rapid exchange uh, innovation, you know, it's a it's it's a stupid innovation, really, right? You just move the access point of the guide wire uh, to a different point, right? Um, but it's strictly a usability feature, uh, and within two to three years, it essentially wiped out the entire over the wire market, right? And you know, if you look at the hierarchy of of value to a customer, uh, safety and efficacy is always going to come in at the top. You know, that's that's always the thing that they care about most. Uh, but usability always tracks in and, and efficiency and can you guarantee that I'll get the same result every time? You know, those things all slot in, you know, together with cost kind of, you know, right under safety and efficacy. Uh, so it does drive uh, a lot of adoption and, uh, and value, you know, and I think from an investor standpoint and when you look at uh, acquisition in particular, right, and, and, and exit price, um, which is sort of two sides of the same coin, you know, I think from the, the acquirer side, you know, anytime that they see something that will need to be remediated uh, or improved upon, uh, you know, lowers the acquisition cost, right? So if it's, you know, uh, unless the value of the safety and efficacy data or the intellectual property is, is so high, you know, if they're looking at, you know, all right, we're going to bring this in, but then we're going to need to bring Zymedica on to completely redo the user interface or the usability, uh, you know, that all works into their financial equation, right? So if you can address some of that early, uh, that, you know, automatically improves uh, your, your valuation, right? And, you know, and I think the investors, you know, and from an investor standpoint, right, if it's an A round, a B round, I think, uh, you know, and, 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 you know, it'd be interesting to get your opinion on this too, Paul, uh, you know, I think something that just looks better uh, is, uh, you know, is always a, a, a more uh, enticing uh, uh, target for, for investment, right? So, I th you know, sort of, you know, I'm kind of all over on this question here, you know, but I think there is a, a value both at the early stage investment and then certainly as you get on to, to exit. Yeah. And one point to what Mike said, I think it's very well, well, well put. I think another axis of, of, of dimensionality thing about its preference. It's a very funny thing to think about though. Uh, if you have two devices that work the same, but one is a real pain to use and one isn't, there that that's going to play into the equation of of who wants to use something. And we've 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 seen doctors fling a device across the room because it's it's been a pain to set up or something has failed on that, and it's not been easy to use, and that that happens. So um, I think at the same time too, I think you can look at usability. It can beyond the the safe. Uh, efficacious and functionality, you can also create an experience that someone wants to be a part of and they want to use it. And that's not just the user, the, the physician, it's also the nursing, nurses and, and team around that. If the device is easy to, um, if it's packaged in a clever way that you can, you can identify it easily, if it's easy to reprocess, if it's a very well thought out training uh, regimen too, that will help to understand and, and really create the kind of preference and, and believability in the product and ultimately will minimize and, and shorten the amount of, tr of training and, and the, the latency opportunities or any of the challenges that may pop up too. So um, preference does also play into, in, in, into that consideration that can really help the market share and the value as well. So the functionality that, that Mike had mentioned with the overwire versus you know the system, that was a huge one for sure from a functionality standpoint and, and really increased, increased and improved the workflow and ease of use. There's a lot of factors that kind of, you know, can, can really enhance the sort of experience of using a product that really will ultimately move the needle towards you in, in market share for sure. Yeah, let me, um, let me dig into that just a little bit more too um, for, for either one of you um, or any of you. Uh, and that is, as you were talking a minute ago, David, about like, you know, training and all those components that go into workflow and using a device, you don't want the doctor throwing your thing across the, the room for sure, or the nurse or whomever. Um, and I think, again, you know, these are things that traditionally, I mean, I work with a lot of companies and I know that they're so laser focused on like the device itself and making sure that the device achieves the thing that they're trying to, to do, whatever that is. Um, and, and, you know, the question is, um, you know, I mean, clearly from what you're describing, 
that human factors and the and the usability and the human centered design component is so important because it really is that entire holistic experience and you know having people want to use this device and being excited about using the device that really you know can choose as you mentioned before you know picking it off the shelf i think it was mike who said that which one they choose based on just the packaging maybe so you know a question a really important question is like you know is, is human centered design and these processes is that expensive is that something that you know take you know costs a lot um, or is this something that you know can be done in a in a in a way that can be super cost effective you know kind of at the early stages when people frankly don't have a lot of money and and for or at least they've allocated a lot of the money towards the you know the team that's building that product or or clinicals or whatever it might be so how expensive is human centered design you have to give me a quote but um you know is there you know is it that you know is this stuff that can be done cost effectively at an early stage uh david yeah i'll, I'll chime in i'm sure we're all going to have our opinions on this for sure and edit and insight um, I don't think it has to be so expensive. I think it's really a thought process more than it is an extra tool in the quiver. Um, it's really, it's how you think about developing and designing a device and making sure you're asking the right kind of questions and doing the right kind of activities to help encourage that kind of user-centered approach. So I think, you know, in any kind of development process, you are looking for inputs, you're understanding, you're trying to figure out what you want to design, you want to figure out, you want to, you want to build it, you want to test it, make sure it performs. It's just making sure you're thinking about it from a user's perspective. So I think some of the uh, front side, it may color some of the questions you ask. You may not just to understand the mechanical, you may also may want to understand why. Why is this person doing it this way? What's important about, why are their hands positioned like that? Um, that may not be a question that engineering may want to ask right away, but it's definitely a, a beginning of usability, kind of a human centered question, line of questioning. That's all part of understanding the need or the problem before we start developing something. So I think it's asking the right kind of questions. I think later on, I mean, as you start getting into, I mean, prototyping and iterating is definitely something we all do with any kind of developing of any kind of activity. Um, thinking about a system, we're always thinking about packaging, we're thinking about, you know, the experience of the, the IFU, the quick reference guide, the device, reprocessing, it's all part of it. But I think it's the lens at which we look through the project and making sure that we're thinking about, um, you know, inviting um, a, 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 that perspective to the table as we're designing, developing something. Um, I think the backside, when you start getting into testing, it's definitely getting, you know, users involved, not just, you know, going on the office and saying, hey, Bob, what do you think? Hey, it works pretty well. You know, make sure we're asking the right kind of users and getting their expert opinion. And they typically uh, will give us a very good um, unfiltered kind of response to something. So I don't think you have to be that, it doesn't have to be that, that expensive a process. We can also use very low fidelity moments of doing friends and family, where maybe you're not doing a formative or a summative, but you're really trying to get that first level of feedback by a key opinion leader or an expert, or you may know, hey, my wife knows uh, someone in caregiving in the space. I'm, I like to find out if I can ask her opinion and get some feedback. You gotta be careful about, of course, about the, you know, the whole confidentiality of it. So we have people on our camera network that are, that are, that are um, good for that. Um, you gotta be sensitive always about, about IP and everything. But I think having that kind of low fidelity moment, you can really lower the amount of, of cost and, and, and setup to getting, but getting good user feedback is always important for sure. Yeah, let me, let me move ahead because I wanna make sure we only have seven minutes of the, of the live broadcast left, if you can believe it. Um, this is going really fast. So let me try and get to a couple of additional questions here. So, you know, one is just as a practical matter, like how do we do this? How do we measure? Um, the impact that user-centered design is having on, um, on the ability to complete the tasks that are needed to use the device. So as a practical matter, how, how do you do that? Uh, David. Oh, <laughs> I, was, I was looking to Jan. He's, he's, he's been quiet too long. If you want to maybe ask right. it of Jan, uh, perhaps. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Dave. <laughs> um, yeah, so really how we measure it uh, kind of goes back to a lot of the points that that have just been brought up and how much they bring down the pain points that that we see in the industry afterwards uh dave brought up uh, ease of use ha having that physician throwing something across the room and even having those discussions early on of how things are used. And I, I like to describe, uh, describe this as the, the, the tridal knowledge and expectations that the user has of the system. Now you, you go into a surgical theater, they're, they're used to how things work, whether it's foot pedals, how the lighting is set up, different sounds, different colors, and having that basis to go on and defining new systems, using things that they're already used to 
really takes a lot of that learning curve off of that. And that's that early uh, just understanding the users and doing some human factor studies on top of them. And uh, don't have to talk about everything we do in HCD, but the, the usability studies and the usability testing, accessibility testing are always important to see how it's going to work. So just understanding where your clients and who your users are coming from and what they're used to and what their expectations are. And, and of course, it helps if they have a ton of knowledge in the system that you're developing, really helps that and get that ease of use and you know, you're going on to, to the next hurdle. Um, another thing that we run into, working on that compliance and security. So we're, we're heading to a connected world. You have all of these uh, Internet of Things, the IoT edge devices connecting up and how they're communicating with each other. Um, and especially in a COVID world, how do you do maintenance on this? So you're developing that strategy for them so that just helping them out. Do they have to send somebody or can you build your cloud infrastructure so that just like your smart TV or you, you connect it, it sees a patch, it pulls it down. Can we also develop these devices to maintain themselves and uh, pull down new firmware and get themselves upgraded as well? So the measurement is how much time and cost and overhead you're saving afterwards by doing a lot of these studies up front. Uh, if someone doesn't have to go to a week's worth of training to use this because they're already familiar with a lot of the features of it because we did the research and brought them exactly what they know, uh, saves a huge, huge amount of time, and it really makes them happy when they're using the system. And they can identify it, and they feel like they, they've always had it. And if I could piggyback on Jan's point there real quick, uh, you know, I would always advocate putting this in as a secondary endpoint in your clinical trials, right? Uh, you know, or figuring out what that is. So if you're already conducting a safety and efficacy trial, you know, include some economic endpoint on time of procedure or you know are you you know narrowing the bell curve of procedures or, or something right because these usability improvements almost always are going to have an economic uh impact to them right so they're going to you know shorten cath lab time or operating time or or shorten the time it takes to become an expert in doing a procedure you know like a, a mitral valve repair or meniscal repair or something like that and so whatever that usability uh improvement is uh, is going to have, hopefully, or it should have, uh, an economic improvement. So I would, you know, it, you get it for free. You're already doing the clinical trial. It doesn't take any more time to collect a secondary endpoint with a, you know, a secondary economic endpoint. And so definitely always consider something like that. Yeah, and, and just as a follow-up to that, Mike, are there any other things that you would recommend that people consider, like, as you know, as you said, secondary endpoints, things they can be collecting, while they're already doing their studies, you know, that are, that will, will be really helpful for the company downstream. So whether it's usability related, whatever it might be, but any other things you recommend people, you know, collect that they don't think of typically that you, you come and you go, God, why didn't you guys do that? Um, you had the opportunity in that last study. Did you do that? Are there any, can you give us some more specific examples, tips? Yeah. I, I mean, I think, you know, things like uh, uh, lab time and, and, time on the pedal or imaging time, you know, those are all things that, uh, you know, end up to overall total procedure cost, right? That might be a little bit easier to quantify than procedure cost because that varies from hospital to hospital and is kind of a, a, a very, uh, you know, sort of black arts kind of calculation. Um, you know, but I think, you know, things like that, if you can reduce the number of operators, so if you can take something that's normally done by, two operators with a lab tech down to one operator. Uh, you know, if you can uh, shorten the procedure time so that a hospital can fit in, you know, eight cases instead of four cases, uh, you know, those are all, you know, pretty, you know, they, they seem like fluffy endpoints, uh, but they, they actually have, have an impact, right? Uh, you know, and I think, uh, you know, the, the time to becoming uh, an expert, uh, you know, is, is another one that's kind of hard to, uh, to measure necessarily in a, in a clinical trial, but that, you know, sort of the impact of training, uh, you know, is, I don't really have a good answer on, on how to, to measure that endpoint, um, but that's, that's another, you know, sort of key economic driver. Thanks. So I'm going to repeat 
a similar question, David and Jan, for you guys to close out this first hour, um, which again are, you know, our tips, you know, we want to make sure people are avoiding mistakes and, um, and learning from the masters here. So what are some other tips that you would offer um, specific again to human centered design, digital thinking, et cetera, um, as we, as you close this out, give us your words of wisdom. <laughs> so, uh, uh, yeah, I'll jump in. Thank you. That's a great question. I think um, uh, uh, pride doesn't have a lot of a lot of a lot of place in, in pride development. I think we all convince ourselves that things work a certain way, and we we got it. It's all figured out. It's easy to use, um, you know. And I think that we need to be okay with with saying we need some help in this, and it's okay to have the user, you know, tell us and, and help us advise it. They're not going to tell us what the technology wants to be. It's it's the Henry Ford analogy of you know I ask I ask people what they wanted. They say they want a faster horse. That's not what we're talking about here. We're really talking about having us, us understand how they can do their job better and really improve it. So I think that the, the reality is, is I think we know a lot about the technology or, or um, as, you, as, a, as a developer, you know a lot about your technology, you know some about the market, you know something about the user, but being okay with, with saying, you know what, we need some, some help guiding us towards something that we want to take the world by storm. We wanna change the market. We really want to be, um, uh, you know, our, our opinions are important, but ultimately have the users help in, in guiding you to make some really good choices to really refine that because they're, they're the ones who will be using it at the end of the day. And if they're not able to use it or, or it, it allows them to be able to use better, easier, shorten the, 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 you know, the activity they're associated with, have better health outcomes for themselves and for others, that's a very important thing. So I think honestly, um, it's, 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 we, we always, we don't know all that we need to know. We need to really make sure that we're asking users to help us down the path is, is, is very, very important piece of advice I would give. Thanks. Uh, and Jan, same question for you. Tips? Yeah. Yeah. Especially that last point that Dave said, uh, that, that was one point that, uh, I always try to stress as well. We, you, you just don't know what you don't know until you get it in front of somebody. So, uh, words of wisdom. Don't be afraid to fail early on. It, it's going to happen. You are not going to nail it the first time around. Well, we know that as we're designing systems, that it's an iterative process. And it, it, if you can get as much material in front of your, your users and your clients uh, so that they can view and relate to and have an emotional response to, that, that's going to help you down the road as well. Uh, the second point is just, Communication and collaboration. Uh, we, we said that a few times. We don't live in silos. Uh, there are a lot of knowledge experts around us and use the resources that, that are available to you. If you get stuck, uh, just ask around, look for other opinions. Uh, if you're building a physical device and uh, even if you're working with, with a, set, a simple carving or whatever, have somebody hold it and identify with it. And from a, a technology, a data, like an app standpoint, have somebody download it and just use it and see how they use it and see how they're interacting with it. Uh, that, that's going to save you a, a lot of time and uh, maybe some hardship down the road as, as you start developing and then realize that you took a wrong turn. But yeah, early on, communicate and uh, just be bold. Bold. I like it. Good tips, guys. Uh, so certainly, you know, we really appreciate the uh, expertise you shared today on the panel. Really great stuff. Uh, uh, I think there's a lot of things that we have further to unpack. And luckily, we've got another 30 minutes with our companies to go dig into some more Q&A. So, um, so thanks for really setting up all these concepts and giving such, you know, such really great, you know, insights into some of the experience you've had um, at Zymedica. So for those of you, again, who, uh, who don't know Zymedica, you can just Google it. It's uh, X I M E D I C A. It's I Medica. Um, I think I spelled that right. Uh, but but uh, thanks, guys. Uh, and uh, Zymedica.com, I'm sure. So so please uh, look them up. Um, and uh, David, Mike, and, and Jan, you know, obviously, you know, we know you guys are busy and you're already giving a lot of your time to help make tech innovators companies. But are you open to having people reach out to you and just start a conversation and, you know, uh, in, in the early days? Is that good? Certainly. Always. Certainly. Always. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I've, I've had that experience. I just wanted to ask you uh, as well. Uh, so that's great, guys. Thank you very much. Um, so again, for anyone who's here as a MedTech Innovator company, stay on. We're going to get to your Q&A now. Um, for those of you who've been watching this on YouTube Live, thanks for tuning in. 
Um, again, medtechinnovator.org slash live is where you can find us. Uh, it's where you can find the schedules of what's coming up. You can watch the replay of this video and the others uh, before it as well. You can even you can subscribe to this channel. You can you can sign up for a little email reminder that we send out the week of uh, the webinars to let you know that they're coming up. So however you want to do that, uh, we'd love to have you back. Thanks for, uh, for joining us and please share this resource with others. Uh, and uh, we'll look to see you guys again next week for everyone else who's not a part of the cohort. So thanks everyone. I'm going to go ahead and stop the live stream. Have a great day.